Hi, everybody. My name is Bastien Montaigne, and I'm a Blender developer since about four years already. And so this talk will be about Blender and asset management. Because blend asset management has been kind of my baby dragon for 10 months already. I started working on it uh, past December when I was three weeks working on the institute here in Amsterdam. So let's start with a few general definitions and concepts. First, what is an asset? So if you want to, if you go to the dictionary, Quoting in their definition, an asset is any component, model, process, or framework of value that can be leveraged or reused. Fine. We now know what is an asset. An asset is pretty much everything. On the right part, I'll try to lay out a few points that I think are required for an asset. It must be self-contained, and yet it's usually compound. That means when you are using a character as an asset, for example, it's made of geometry, materials, textures, uh, probably a skeleton, poses, etc. However, you do not want to have to go fetch everything, every element of those separately. You want to consider your object or character as a single entity. Must be reusable and shareable. I think this is quite common sense. And it may be procedural. I mean, pretty much any asset can be procedural on some point. You are just linking, for example, a node tree of a material. You can change the output of the node tree by changing its input conditions. But to what I refer here as procedural is more things like, for example, uh, presets or sets of settings. They are not data in themselves. They are used to generate data. So, and yet, they can be considered as an asset. So from that, I think we can say that in Blender we already have assets, they're just data blocks. I mean, you can link, link them, share them, they have dependency between them, so. Next, asset management. I didn't even try to put a definition from web for that because it's just cover only you know financial things and all that so just what do we expect from asset management it had to handle storage of assets or to be it internally or using other tools i mean you do not want to bother where you are putting your data, what file names, what kind of data structures and all that. It's handled by the asset management. It has to feature advanced browsing of assets. For example, searching with tags or category. Maybe you can filter your asset by popularity or by pure priority. So you know some kind of data you usually do not really need them to leak directly so they can have a low priority and all the type of data or some specific objects that you keep using very frequently in your workflow, you can give them iOS priority and so, well, that's just idea. I mean, yeah, many different ways of handling bruising of assets, but it may keep history of changes. That's not really mandatory, but it's usually when you're working on a big project, it's a very important part. So version control systems or whatever else. But, um. And last but not least, it has to keep track of assets in the consumer blend file. That means when you have linked data currently in Blender, you have no real way to control which version of the data you are using. We want to be able to keep the, a link between the asset management system and the data inside the Blender file to be able, for example, to fetch a new version, change the revisions, for example, low poly, high poly, and so on. So all this leads to the, one of the main ideas behind the project, that is asset engines, because there are so many different ways of handling and managing assets. We don't want to enforce some specific process inside Blender itself, in Blender Core. So we, the idea is to delegate this to asset management, this asset management to what I call asset engines, 
who are actually quite similar in principle to render engines, for example. And, well, the main part of this uh, presentation will be about that project. So, now we are going to switch to the dirty details. Let's first resume the core ideas behind that project and the implementation that has been done already. We want to define an asset API and not an asset engine inside Blender itself. That means Blender does not have to care about how assets are stored, what kind of metadata you store with your assets. Uh, it just want to have data in the end and everything else is asset engine uh, task. So this asset API has to be simple and yet flexible because as I already, already said, there's many different workflow possible for asset management. We want to keep and build on existing library handling because, well, Linking is not a simple process. If you do not believe me, just have a look at the code. I mean, it's not cycles, of course, but yet it has many potential corner cases and difficulties. So let's not reinvent the wheel and let's just keep what is already working rather well. This will also allow us fail-safe behavior because if for, the, for some reason the asset engines become unavailable or not working. As long as the blend files remains available on your file system, you can still open a Blender file which has been using assets. It will just link the data from the libraries as it is doing already now. So you, you lose, of course, some features related to asset management, but you do not lose all the data you have linked in. And for the same reason, it also gives, gives us backward and forward compatibility. That means a blend files created using asset engines should be usable with all the versions of Blender which do not have asset engines or some who do not have the same asset engine installed and so on. And finally, it uh, ensures us that opening a blend file remains rather efficient. We'll see why uh, later. And yes, the, for the same reasons, it's consequences of the first point, an asset API should only manipulate metadata about assets, and actual data linking remains uh, a lower level library code, which is already existing, mostly. So before working in the asset engine itself, there are several things to be changed in Blender. The first one was making the file browser asset ready because in previous code, there was the file browser working was really tightly linked to how a regular file system is, is defined. I mean, it, didn't, it wasn't ready for things like tags or it wasn't efficient if you had to list tens of thousands of items, it would just eat your memory and all that kind of problem. So I had to split this in different steps. And this has been done in Merge and Master a few months ago, so it's available in the 2.76 release. Then we have to fix the missing linked data blocks issue. We probably all knows what happens when you open a blend file which is trying to use data from libraries who are not available. You just lose them. And especially if you have, you've saved your blend file, then you lose them definitively. That's not cool. So the idea instead is to generate some placeholder data blocks. That means there are data blocks in the same time that uh, one sh you, who should have been linked, but they are just empty. However, they allow us to keep the reference to the data blocks from inside the libraries. So once you have opened your Blender file with missing data, you have those empty placeholders. 
you can keep editing your blend file, you can modify the um, library path in the old liners, you can save your blend file, reload, and you will find again your data. You won't have lose anything. This has been made just a few days ago in master, so you can try it already. And the last point is relocating and reloading libraries uh, on the fly. That is, without having to reload the whole blend file, which is using them. This is, well, in current state, it's just a matter of being more user friendly, but for the, we'll see later for the asset management system, it's becoming quite kind of mandatory feature. And it's a bit challenging. Well, it's not really challenging, but it touches areas in Blender core which are very deep in the roots of Blender. So we have to be careful with the chance here. Many old code to. It's my, I've been working on this in the ID remap branch av available on the Git repository of Blender. It's mostly also, also a matter of cleaning what we already have in the code, who is managing data blocks and all those kind of things. Now, let's see the data structures defined so far. First, we have the communication with the asset engines. This is mostly used in file browser and probably outliner in future too. And Quite obviously, obviously, it's not stored in Blender file. It's just live data. But they are defining the common basis that all asset engines should be able to feature. So we have an ent entry, which represents classically the asset itself. Each entry stores a, a list of variants. who can be, for example, used for I or low poly. Um, objects, or you can have several variants for uh, given materials, whatever. And each variant stores a list of revisions, which are used ob obviously to store the history of these changes. This is kind of the, the last two um, structures are kind of optional, but I think it allows us to represent pretty much every possible data to some extent. We'll see, it's not stuck right now, we can add or remove things as needed. One of the important things is the UUID member data, which is used, will be used by Blender as a unique reference for the asset. So when Blender needs to communicate again to the asset manager, we don't want to store too much data. We just store those, those three UUIDs in every data blocks that has been linked by the, from the asset engines. And the asset engine is expected to be able to find again uh, the relevant information about the assets. So that slide represents the change to the data structures which has a core of Blender. I don't know if every, probably don't, everyone did not know what is ID, but ID is really the kind of the parent of all data block structures. That means it's really the basis of data in Blender. So I am trying to keep the changes in this area as limited as possible, and the idea of the unique UUID. And we also have changes to the library data blocks to, to um, store references to the asset engines himself, ID name and versions, and the root path of the repository because of course an asset engine may handle several different repositories, it, so we have to keep a, a reference for that too. Know the main part in some way because workflows, I mean, it's a, a simplistic description of how things are happening in the code. So it's what really drives the type of data we want, the API we are going to need to implement this and everything. First, uh, that's the, main, the best defined part because mostly it has already been implemented in the, in the branch, in the asset engine branch. It's using assets, that is, bruising them and linking them inside Blender. 
The main editor is the file browser for that, of course. However, you may note that the third part of the schema, the bottom one, is actually implemented at the import uh, linking operators level, which means that it's available from pretty much everywhere inside Blender. So if you want to make a customization and everything. And I don't think we have really time to go in this schema step by step, but there's another point which is quite Im important here. It's that asset engines, well, we probably have some who are working on the web or network or other con constraints which implies some delay. So we have to, to have a design which allows not immediate response. So on this schema, the dashed, dashed lines and the italic text Mm, are here to materialize the um, asynchronous answers from the asset engine. That is, Blender sends a query for the asset engine, for example, requesting the numbers of avail available entries, and then it will keep poking the asset engines regularly until it gets the final number. That allows not locking the user interface for process who are a bit slow for some reason. Then what happens when we save or load a Blender file, which is using data from asset engines? Well, when we are saving, nothing new happens. I mean, we just store the, the data blocks with the new UUID data, and that's all. On loading, the, again, for speed issues, the main idea is to not change the main part of the loading of the blend file. We are just trying to read uh, library, existing libraries as usual, and if something is missing, we generate our placeholders. And then the main idea would be to run a background job after loading is done, which would go checking each data blocks and creating the asset engines to see if, well, if it's missing to get uh, again the data, and if for example, if the um, asset was set to always use the latest, latest revision, we would go querying the asset engines to ensure we have the latest revision, all that kind of things. So that's a part which implies the ability to reload uh, on the fly the library's data. The next workflows are less defined because I didn't really start implementing them already. So it's more a list of requirement about them. The asset, loaded asset management, by that I mean handling assets you are using already in your brand file. For example, you, want, you may want to select or reload different variants, different revisions on the fly. You also remove loaded assets or relocate a, li a library for whatever reason. This will happen in the outliner, of course, following the Blender way of doing things that are file browser and mostly used to bruise and load new data, while the outliner is used to manage loaded data. And yeah, and so again, about variance and revisions, the idea is also to have some kind of common options, like, for example, a default variant and latest revision, which would be kind of some special values. And again, this implies being able to reload data on the fly from libraries. And finally, the last part is that you want to be able to edit your asset repositories. That is, add assets, update, remove, replace, edit some asset metadata like tag descriptions, add new revisions, and so on. So the main problem here is that this will most likely very, be, it will be very tightly related to the asset engine himself. I mean, that's mostly asset engines stuff to be done. Blender should not care too much about it. So 
will probably leave most of this to the asset engines. The question currently is whether we should have a basic support for very basic editing task in the asset engine API. I do not really have an answer about that yet. It also depends on other uh, projects, like for example, uh, finishing the UI, the UI customization from Python, because if you can define your own editor from Python, that, uh, then asset engines, we have may add-ons, could define their own editor if they want advanced and complex uh, repository management. Of course, there are still many open topics and questions. So the first one is kind of um, anecdotic because um, do we want to keep track of loaded data when we are actually appending? You know, Blender currently has two ways of linking data. You can just link them and they are, you are still using data from the library file or you can append them. Appending is kind of very similar to creating new data directly in the Blender file because you have no more relation to the library once it's done. Also, yeah, do we want to only use IDs, that is data blocks, or do we also want to handle other file types? I am thinking here mostly about pictures, sounds, videos, because, you know, while it's possible for an asset manager to just have a database of image and then go generating a blend files with image data blocks itself to allow Blender to link from there, but it sounds a bit over complicated. So idea would be to try to extend a bit the linking, the linking process to be able to also load that kind of uh, common files. Common asset types, well, I'm not very fond of the idea. The idea would be to have some kind of, let's say, ghost data block who would be used by asset engines as hooks inside Blender. That means Blender wouldn't know anything about that data type it would just exist in his uh, in his files and it would be used by the asset engine but i think we can do without that kind of uh, ugly tricks handling several data blocks as a single asset is a quite important topic currently my main idea would be to use the library data block behind it because as you probably know each time you are leaking some data from a library, you are also creating a library data block inside Blender, which, refer which mostly keeps the f file path to that data block. So it would be, could be a rather simple to extend a bit this and use those library data blocks as kind of asset data blocks, actually. That's just an idea right now. It's not yet uh, defined or and user interface, of course, but that's also related to the project of the other, other 2.8 project. So that's it for the presentation. You can also find on the web link on the bottom of the screen the written uh, version of this presentation. So thanks everybody for your attention.